Hello, and welcome to today's ISLC STARS webinar. We're going to be talking about cancer drug development in the era of precision medicine. Next slide. My name is Janet Freeman Daly, and I will be your moderator for this session. I'm a lung cancer patient, a cancer research advocate, co-founder and director of the Ross Wonders and a STAR staffer. Our speaker today is William Powell, MD, PhD, head of Roche Pharmaceutical Research and Early Development. Previously, Dr. Powell was professor of medicine, cancer biology and pathology at Vanderbilt University, director of division of hematology oncology and director of personalized cancer medicine at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center and a practicing medical oncologist. He pioneered precision medicine for lung cancer by identifying sensitivity of lung cancers with certain gene mutations to the drugs we now call targeted therapies. Dr. Pau, would you like me, how would you like me to address you? Uh, Jenna, you can just call me William, that's fine. Great, thank you, William. Next slide. Before Dr. Powell begins, or William begins, we have some uh -huh. housekeeping notes. If you would like to download today's slides, you can access them by clicking on the link in the chat. That's a link to the webinar page on the IASLC website. The recording of this session will also be available there within the week. Your camera and microphone will remain off for this webinar. Please enter any questions you have for the Q&A session using the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar page. We will not be using the raise hand function or the chat function for Q&A. However, you may use the chat function for other discussions. Also, please note that William cannot give medical advice during this webinar. We will not be taking any questions about individual patient cases. Next slide. This webinar is part of the ISLC STARS program. STARS stands for Supportive Training for Advocates on Research and Science. This program aims to increase the number of lung cancer patient research advocates that are equipped to provide accurate translation of lung cancer science and research for other patients and their caregivers, and to bring the patient perspective to lung cancer research and policy. Funding for this webinar is provided by STARS sponsors, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Lilly Oncology. A link to the STARS webpage is in the chat. Next slide. Here are our disclosures. Now for the reason we're here. William, please tell us about cancer drug development in the era of precision medicine. Uh, thanks a lot, Janet, and it's really great to be here uh, and uh, speaking to the stars uh, of ISSLC, uh, which has been a great organization as an advocate for lung cancer and lung cancer research. Uh, so greetings from Basel. I hope you guys are all okay, uh, healthy and safe. Uh, and for the next 25 minutes or so, I'll just give a overview, uh, including historical context uh, for targeted therapies uh, and now precision medicine uh, in the 21st century. Um, so I'm dating myself a little bit, but uh, when I was a fellow in uh, training in medical oncology, uh, this was the view of lung cancer. So this was in the early 2000s. Uh, and as you all know, basically there were two main types of lung cancer non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. Uh, this was based on probably uh, more than 100 years of just looking under the microscope. Uh, and it wasn't any more differentiated than that. Uh, and if you, if you think about it, it's very odd. It's like calling an apple a non-orange, like an orange and a non-orange. But anyway, so you have small cell lung cancer and then non-small cell lung cancer. And then we knew non-small cell lung cancer had three uh, distinct histo histologic subtypes, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and large cell carcinoma. So this was the scientific view of lung cancer at that time. And during our training, uh, this was a key paper that came out in 2002 in the New England Journal, one of the top journals uh, that, that helps guide uh, treatment in medicine. 
Uh, and there was a, basically a study of thousands of patients with quote unquote modern chemotherapy doublets. Uh, so modern chemotherapy doublets, meaning cisplatin and paclitaxel or taxol, cisplatin and gemcitabine or cisplatin and gemzar, cisplatin and docetaxel, taxotere and carboplatin and paclitaxel. Uh, and this is a Kaplan-Meier curve where on the x-axis uh, is the uh, months of survival. Uh, and on the y-axis, you have the percent surviving. And so at time zero, when everyone starts on the trial, they're all alive 100%. Uh, and then over time, unfortunately, patients um, do not survive. Uh, and you can see that basically uh, there are modern chemotherapy doublets, four of them, but there's no difference uh, in survival. Uh, and so when we were trained as a fellow, basically we were told that, you know, you choose uh, the, the treatment uh, based on the patient's uh, other um, potential side effects and the kind of side effects that they might tolerate. Uh, and also you have no idea if it's going to work in a patient until you give it to them. So you give it for two cycles, get a scan, and then you'll be able to uh, say whether it's working or not. And about a third of the time, uh, tumors will shrink. A third of the time, tumors will stay the same, and then a two third of the time, tumors will grow. So, uh, as you can imagine, it's completely unsatisfactory as a doctor uh, to to have this kind of approach uh, to treating lung cancer. Uh, and so, many of us at the time, uh, including myself, were very, very interested in new therapies that were coming out at the time, uh, and. In the early 2000s, the EGF receptor or epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, EGFR TKIs, were being ju just being developed. Uh, and the, one of the first ones was Jafitinib, which we now know as Aresa. Uh, and so while I was in the laboratory, uh, I was also then uh, in the clinic as a fellow and seeing very dramatic responses in some patients. This is actually uh, a chest x ray uh, or serial chest x rays from a patient I saw. Uh, who had come from upstate New York. Uh, she had had multiple lines of chemotherapy. She had come in a wheelchair on oxygen. Uh, and basically, uh, we, uh, she told us that she was a never smoker, meaning she had smoked less than 100 cigarettes in a lifetime, uh, and uh, that she had no other options. And so we put her on Jafitinib at the time. It was an expanded use protocol. And literally within five days, we got this x-ray. And you can see all the fluffy stuff over here, which was tumor. Uh, had uh, very, very quickly resolved. So it was quite incredible. But the most incredible thing is she called three days later to say that she felt like a new woman. She had actually come off of oxygen. She had been out of a wheelchair uh, and really had a, a very, very dramatic response. Unfortunately, uh, the number of people who had such a dramatic response was really only a minority of patients, really only about 10% uh, in Western populations. And then when we studied who, what were the clinical characteristics of patients who might have such a great response, it turned out to be women, uh, more likely to be Asian, and then have specifically adenocarcinoma histology, and then also have no history of smoking. So we and others set out to really try to figure out why is it this subset of patients who may benefit, and is there a better way to predict who's going to benefit uh, based on some kind of genetic uh, marker. And to make a very long story short, we and others uh, then found in 2004 that there indeed was a genetic basis for why some patients, or only one out of 10, responded dramatically to EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors like gefitinib and erlotinib. This is a complicated slide, but it basically depicts the EGF receptor protein. And then here in blue, there's the signaling portion, the part that we call the tyrosine kinase portion. Uh, and then to make a very long story short, we found that there were uh, four types of mutations uh, and predominantly there's what we call today exon 19 deletions and then point mutations which change a leucine to an arginine at position 858. I won't go too much into details about the science, but it was very clear then that patients who had EGF receptor mutations uh, were the ones most likely to benefit from these drugs. Now, just to tell you how long it sort of then takes uh, uh, history to, to accept these findings, I, I will go into that. But before I want to do that, I just want to tell you that there are four main types of genomic changes that can cause cancer. Uh, this is at a very high level. So on the far left, you have base substitutions. This means that a mutation actually changes an amino acid. 
like on leucine to arginine at position 858 in EGFR. Then you can have what are called insertions and deletions. This means in the DNA, you can have things inserted into it or deleted from it, uh, which leads to aberrant uh, proteins. Uh, and the example here is an exon 19 deletion. You can also have what's called copy number alterations. Basically, this means you have too many copies of the gene. Uh, in, in normal cells, you have one copy from your mom and one copy from your dad, but in cancer cells, you can get abnormally high copies. And an example of that is met amplification. And then the fourth type is uh, rearrangements. And that's where one part of a chromosome where the DNA is, gets abnormally linked to another part of the chromosome. Uh, and it puts two proteins together that aren't supposed to be together. And that leads to a rearrangement or a fusion. This will become relevant for when I talk about uh, precision medicine in general. Anyway, so we had found these age of receptor mutations uh, but what we really needed to do was understand how common it was and you know, how often are we uh, seeing it in patients? And also, can we then figure out why some patients really benefit, uh, like I showed you in the chest X-ray, but then over time, basically after a year, their tumors start to grow again. And we call that disease progression acquired resistance. And uh, Unfortunately, it occurs in uh, uh, you know, many, many uh, cancer patients. And back in the 2000s, I just want to bring you back to that time, uh, there was very little understood about acquired resistance, especially in lung cancer. Uh, and at the time, there was another disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML. It's a type of hematologic malignancy. And there was another drug called imatinib or Gleevec that had just been approved in 2000. And learning from our colleagues in hematology, we saw that uh, when patients initially responded and then progressed um, on imatinib, that they would have specific changes in the DNA in the target of imatinib. Uh, and so we thought, well, maybe the same thing is happening in EGFR mutant lung cancer, where you get an EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It really benefits you for a long time. And then over time, uh, it starts to grow again because of changes in the target. Now, how could we prove that? Well, the reason I'm talking to you about this is because we actually had to establish a new kind of protocol. I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering at the time. Uh, and we actually had to try to get tissue, cancer tissue from patients whose tumors had responded and then progressed. Now at the time, uh, everyone said when we started this, this, it was unethical to biopsy patients after their cancers were growing, that patients wouldn't uh, volunteer for that you know, we would have a hard time getting people to enroll. Um, but we tried anyway, because uh, scientifically it was really important for us to understand that. And so we wrote this protocol uh, and basically said, you know, you had to have responded to erlotinib or gefitinib, you had to have had a response, then you had to have your tumor grow, and then you had to have a tumor of big enough size so that we could actually biopsy it. And then we, after patients signed consent, we would actually then put a needle or some kind of biopsy to get the tissue, and then we would analyze it at the DNA level. And um, this is an example, for example, of a patient uh, who I also saw. Um, this is a computed tomography scan, uh, you know, where um, patients are like a hot dog sort of put through a tube and then sliced, uh, and the head is at the front and the feet are uh, at the back. Uh, and then you can see serially uh, what's happening in the lungs, for example. Uh, and here, um, you can see this patient, this is the chest area, uh, here's the heart of all of these white fluffy things are tumor. Uh, initially, when this patient started erlotinib, then her tumor shrank, uh, almost disappeared. Uh, but then after about two years, the tumor started to grow again, specifically here. She also had a growing lesion in the bone. So she was one of the first patients to consent for the rebiopsy, and we uh, analyzed bone tissue as well as lung tissue. Uh, and basically, in the first six patients, uh, we were able to find one of the key resistance factors that led to uh, why uh, patients who responded to erlotinib or gefitinib, why they eventually had their tumors start growing again. Basically, from analyzing the tissue from the patients whose tumors grew, we were able to show they actually had a second mutation in EGFR. Uh, and that second mutation was called T790M that basically changed a threonine to methionine position 790. 
Uh, and this is uh, a, a picture showing you what that um, mutation might do. Um, so here is an example in the background here of the EGF receptor. And then this is the threonine or the T uh, in a normal patient, in a normal tumor. Um, and this is the drug or lotinib in, in the pocket. But when you change the T to an M, methionine, you can see that it starts to uh, encroach here upon the drug and basically doesn't allow for good drug binding of the drug. Uh, and that's a potential explanation for why patients eventually get uh, resistance. Now you might ask, why is that important? Well, once we could actually then, oh, well, actually before I get into that, let me just <laughs> highlight. So this was 2005. We had found each of receptor mutations in 2004. Then we found a resistance mutation in 2005, but it didn't take till 2009 uh, where the rest of the world community accepted that EGF receptor mutations were actually a predictor of response. So you might think that's a short period of time. You might think that's a long period of time. Um, you know, it took about four or five years for the whole community to be convinced that EGF receptor mutation testing was valuable. And so before that, actually, some places did it and some places didn't. Uh, and your care was highly dependent upon who believed in Egypt receptor mutation and who didn't. Anyway, um, the first study that showed uh, the benefit was this Aresa Pan Asian study called IPASS. Uh, and again, these are Kaplan Meier curves. Uh, so it, it gets a little complicated. There's four Kaplan Meier curves. So patients with advanced lung cancer were randomized to either Aresa or chemotherapy. And in the overall population, you can see that there was some benefit in the gefitinib arm uh, versus the chemo arm. Uh, but, uh, but, this, but the progression uh, basically was very quick in both. If you turned out to have an EGF receptor mutation, then you did much better on ERESA than if you did uh, chemotherapy. And the opposite was seen if you didn't have a mutation, you actually did better on chemotherapy than you did on ERESA. And so this was really the uh, first uh, evidence from a randomized study that EGF receptor mutation uh, testing was beneficial. Now, um, I talked to you about the T790M mutation. The reason that's so important is that we were then able to design a drug to overcome T790M mediated resistance, or I should say AstraZeneca. Uh, and uh, basically that drug uh, became osimertinib. And so uh, just understanding the resistance mutation allowed us to then go back to the laboratory and to the chemist and say, can you overcome this mutation uh, and essentially that did uh, become possible. And osimertinib was approved in 2015. And so from 2005 to basically 2015, in a short time, 10 years, uh, we were able to identify the resistance mutation and then have a drug approved to overcome that. Now, I'm happy to say that since the early, whoops, hmm. since the early 2000s, uh, you know, almost 20 years later, there's actually been great progress in molecularly targeted therapy for oncology. This is not an exhaustive list uh, and it's not just lung cancer, uh, but it's incredible to see that all of these targeted therapies here are really just targeting uh, patients that are defined by some kind of molecular aberration. Uh, and so patients now have multiple options really depending upon uh, the tumor mutation status uh, that's, that we can identify. And then even in the course of treatment, uh, there are multiple options which were not previously available. And this is all by subsetting patients and not, no longer just looking at the histology or what the tumors look like under the microscope. Now, you might say, has there really been an impact though? Um, what's really uh, in, been incredible to see is there was a paper in the New England Journal this year in uh, 2020 put out by the National Cancer Institute looking at the impact of targeted therapies in lung cancer. And specifically uh, in the top here, they looked at trends in incidence and incidence-based mortality. So the good thing is uh, the, uh, the incidence has been going down in lung cancer, which is not attributed to the new therapies, but possibly attributed to decreased smoking, et cetera. Um, but they specifically looked at the, when EGFR uh, first line therapy was first approved. I told you testing was first adopted in 2009, but first line EGFR therapy wasn't approved till 2013. 
Uh, and then when you look at the survival rates, actually, you can see that survival trends among men and women basically started to increase just around the time that EGFR therapies were approved in the first line. So this is great progress. Uh, you know, we need to continue to do more. I would say this paper didn't even account for ALK fusions or ROS fusions or even immunotherapy, uh, which has been uh, the new advances that have come since the story about EGF receptor that I told you about. Now, I also mentioned that, uh, you know, patients now have multiple options uh, and basically at different courses in the treatment paradigm, patients can now benefit um, from these different options, depending upon the mutation status of their tumor. This was a really interesting paper from Alice Shaw that was published in the New England Journal in 2016, where she showed the clinical course of a patient of hers with ALK fusion positive lung cancer. Uh, and here, uh, the patient had a biopsy, was shown to have an ALK fusion, uh, got crizotinib, then had a patient, then had another biopsy, then ended up switching to seritinib, uh, then was on another agent for a clinical trial. Unfortunately, at this time, there were no other options, but got chemotherapy. But then the patient had another, um, because of the time in between the first crizotinib and the second time, um, and because the tumor grew again on chemotherapy, uh, she was tried again on crizotinib. Then uh, there was a new ALK fusion inhibitor called lorlotinib. Uh, and basically, the patient then benefited from that. Uh, the patient actually had a resistance mutation. Um, the showing that she, uh, she would likely benefit from lorlotinib, but then after initially having her tumor shrink and grow again, then she underwent another biopsy, and it turned out the biopsy showed that she might benefit from crizotinib, which was the first agent set that she got. Uh, and so basically then a patient was able to go back on crizotinib. So this really just highlights to you how mutation status and biomarker testing can really help guide therapy during the clinical course of a patient who's receiving targeted therapies for specific mutation-driven diseases. Now, I'll touch briefly upon uh, immunotherapy. Uh, so as molecular targeted therapies were being developed, so were immunotherapies. And these are therapies that harness the immune system to attack cancer. I, I don't have time to go into all the details of how those discoveries were made, uh, but uh, first, really, the pioneering work was done in melanoma, a different kind of cancer, a skin cancer. Um, and even in melanoma, you know, first, uh, there was the first um, in the early 2010s, uh, studies showed that targeted therapy uh, were better than chemotherapy. So this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, where months again is on the uh, x-axis and progression C survival on the, on the y-axis. Um, the standard of care uh, for all the 2000s was chemotherapy, something called the carbazine. But then in the mid 2000s, melanoma, half of them were shown to have a specific mutation called a BRAF mutation, a V600E mutation. And then um, basically a drug was uh, developed to overcome that, vemurafenib. And this was the first study to show uh, that vemurafenib targeted therapy was better than chemotherapy, just like I showed you with ARESA in the IPAS study. Well, only a short six years later, uh, immunotherapy was shown to be even more potentially effective in melanoma. Uh, and here, what's really incredible, he, these are Kaplan-Meier curves from uh, patients who were treated with uh, nivolumab, which is a, a PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor, or a combination of immunotherapies. But the details on that are not important. The really key important factor, if you look at these Kaplan-Meier survival curves, is that over time, instead of this curve going down to zero, this curve is starting to flatten out. So you can see that now um, almost 20% of patients are living 36 plus years. Uh, and here, uh, similarly in a separate study, uh, you see now survival rates that we've never ever seen before. Uh, and just look at this study over here where you can see the, cat, the, the curve goes down uh, to close to uh, 10%. So now with immunotherapy, we're really starting to see long-term survival is possible as well in patients with metastatic disease. Now, what does that mean for lung cancer? Uh, this slide summarizes a lot of work done in the entire field uh, about the benefit of, of immunotherapy uh, in lung cancer. The short takeaway is that overall survival in non-small cell lung cancer has definitely improved with the introduction of checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, and um, uh, you can see that in the evolution and history of 
what the therapies were here on the y, x axis, and then the overall survival here on the y axis. So you can see, for example, when I was a fellow, here's platinum doublet chemotherapy. Even before that, people were always in, only using single agent chemotherapy. Um, then we have um, addition of Avastin or Bevacizumab, uh, but you're always sort of around the year mark. Uh, once you get to chemotherapy, which is uh, cancer immunotherapy, sorry, cancer immunotherapy plus chemotherapy or cancer immunotherapy plus other therapy, you're starting to get uh, close to the 20 month uh, survival rate. Uh, so it's pretty incredible. Uh, and then in, even with immunotherapy, we have some markers where we can um, figure out who is most likely to benefit. And the best marker we have right now is something called PDL1 status. Uh, this is a uh, indication of how highly expressed uh, the target, it's one of the targets for PD-1, the checkpoint inhibitors is, and you can see that if you have higher expression of PDL one in your non-small cell lung cancer tumor, then you have a higher likelihood of surviving longer. Uh, we also see this uh, cancer immunotherapy improving overall survival in extensive stage small cell lung cancer. The, the most of the advances I talked to you about with molecular targeted therapy have been in non-small cell lung cancer, but cancer immunotherapy is also benefiting patients with small cell, uh, where we've gone from under a year with chemotherapy to uh, now starting to be more than a year uh, with chemotherapy plus cancer immunotherapy. I won't go into all of the details uh, on the rest of the slide here. Now, I think this is uh, the, the slide that really summarizes where we are today. Uh, compared to 2000, when I showed you that lung cancer was classified according to histology and what it looked like under the microscope, we have a much better way of classifying lung cancer. And the most important thing is it's clinically relevant. Uh, and so uh, what we've seen over the past 15 years or 16 years or so is uh, increasing parts of the lung cancer pie sort of addressed by specific mutations. Uh, I talked in 2004 about discovering EGF receptor mutations, also known at the time was something, uh, a mutation in a gene called KRAS, which is another signaling protein. Um, by 2014, uh, we had many other subsets. Uh, and then today, you can see we have many, many different subsets, some of which are only one to 2% of lung cancer. Uh, and then we can also overlay PDL1 status for the benefit of immunotherapy. Importantly, this shows you that an all comer approach to treating lung cancer uh, doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, you know, if only one out of 100 patients has a ROS uh, fusion, for example, you know, first, not everybody should get a ROS inhibitor, uh, but it also it's important to identify the one out of 100 uh, who does have that ROS uh, uh, fusion so that you can get the right therapy uh, to the patient. Incidentally, the current uh, president of ISLAC, uh, Mitsu, uh, Tetsuya Mitsudomi, uh, was among the first to identify the MET splice mutations. Uh, and there was just recently a MET inhibitor approved uh, for that as well, uh, that particular subset. Now, where are we going in the future? Um, I think this is great progress. Uh, and as you saw from the survival curves, you know, hopefully we're also making a huge impact on survival. Uh, as well as the, the quality of life for patients. Uh, in the future, I think we'll see continued evolution of precision medicine. And one of, the, um, one of the ways that we'll continue to do that is through liquid biopsies. So liquid biopsies are basically drawing blood from patients who have cancer and then using DNA in the blood to identify what mutations uh, are potentially in the tumor. The reason this is so critical is about 30% of lung cancer patients actually don't have enough tissue to biopsy. I showed you some of the pictures of where you have to put a needle in a tumor. Unfortunately, up to a third of patients don't even have a good sample. So if you could just get a blood draw and then analyze your blood to see specifically what type of mutation your lung cancer has, it would simplify things a lot. Uh, and you know, there's already an example of a study that's doing that. It's called the BFAST study. Uh, where patients with uh, lung cancer basically get a blood-based uh, assay, NGS stands for next generation sequencing, and then based on their specific uh, genetic mutation that's found in the blood, they then assign therapy. Uh, and in one study, for example, we showed that patients who got electinib and were found to have an outfusion did just as well as if we had biopsied the tumor. So I think you will expect to see a lot more uh, activity in this space. 
uh, and it could really simplify uh, the way patients are treated. And it can also help us monitor therapy. So if you're on treatment and then you're getting blood draws, you can potentially see resistance earlier uh, than we've ever seen before. Another advance that we're gonna see is something that we call real world data uh, and the use of synthetic controls. Uh, as you know, most of our clinical trials, when we have to get a drug approved, we actually randomize patients to uh, the new therapy versus the standard of care. And this is a requirement usually from regulatory agencies to show that our new therapy is better than the standard of care. Well, if you only have 1% of patients who have that specific alteration, it might become hard to do a randomized study uh, because you just might not find enough patients or it might take you too long to find patients. But if we can use real world data, we may be able to then use in parallel data that's being collected on patients who get standard of care versus single arm studies where patients are actually getting a treatment. So for example, if, if we had a single arm treatment where we patients got electinib, but then we followed patients in the real world who were getting chemotherapy who had an outfusion at the same time, then we could actually use that data to show that electinib actually would be better than standard of care. And here's just an example where we have used that kind of uh, real world data. Um, for example, when uh, Roche was trying to get electinib approved in countries throughout the world, uh, we didn't always have all the randomized studies that the regulatory agencies wanted but through use of real world data, we were able to show that electinib was superior to uh, seritinib and the regulatory agencies actually uh, use that for approval. So we expect that this could lead to even faster approval and more options for patients in the future. So that was uh, a whirlwind tour of the history of molecularly targeted therapy in lung cancer. Uh, these are the main messages uh, that I wanted to leave you with. First of all, it's really scientific breakthroughs and new paradigms that are leading to new and improved outcomes in lung cancer. So back in the 2000s, you know, we looked at lung cancer based on histology and what it looked like under the microscope uh, and everyone was getting chemotherapy. And basically, as I showed you, no, you know, there was no benefit from any modern chemotherapy doublet. Uh, and there was what we call a therapeutic plateau. So we knew we had to do better uh, and better meant really trying to understand the genetic basis of these diseases, finding these uh, clinically relevant molecular subsets, and then finding therapies uh, to overcome those uh, targets. Uh, and that has led to an all comer, from an all comer approach to a molecular subset approach. And now there's lots of options for patients, even with just 1% or even half percent uh, uh, of frequency uh, mutation. And I did want to just make a plug that my patient biopsies before and after treatment are really, really important. I know patients have to undergo a lot of uh, um, extra steps to do that, but it's really important for us to gain new insights and develop new medicines. Then uh, I talked about cancer immunotherapy, which has also led to increasing advances and more survival rates. And even there, some patients are actually living much, much longer than we'd ever expected. But unfortunately, immunotherapy only really benefits about 20 to 30% of patients right now. So we need to continue to do more research there and understand who's benefiting and who's not, and then figure out how to overcome that. And then I talked briefly about a couple of new approaches in the era of precision medicine, uh, one of which is liquid biopsies and the other one, which is real world data. And I think you'll see more of that in the near future. And those will lead to even more advances uh, in uh, via our ability to treat lung cancer. So with that, I just want to thank you. I want to thank ISLAC uh, for inviting me to speak to you today. I want to thank Janet and Kristen and Aubrey also for helping to organize uh, the session. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, William, for sharing your perspective. Um, we do have time for questions and, and they're getting busy. So the first question is from Terry. Um, she's talking about the drugs being able to treat the brain. As you know, um, the blood-brain barrier keeps a lot of the drugs out of the brain. And some of the newer generation TKIs can now treat the brain effectively. But we really haven't had a lot of years of experience with drugs that treat the brain. Uh, what have we learned about short and long-term effects of these drugs and how effective they are? Yeah, so, you know, that's a great question. So the blood-brain barrier is something that nature has put there to prevent, I guess, toxins from getting in the brain. But at the same time, it makes it difficult to get drugs into the brain. 
Um, as you mentioned, there have been advances with that. For example, like osimertinib and uh, alectinib and other drugs do get into the brain. We know the patients with brain meds have their tumor shrink, um, but still the concentration of drug that gets in the brain is lower than in the, in the rest of the body. So I think on one hand, we need to do more just to figure out how to get more drugs in the brain, and that will take additional uh, research. But I think your question is more related to are there long-term side effects from the medicines in the brain? Uh, and there, you know, I think it's always a risk, a therapeutic, it's a risk benefit ratio, right? Uh, if you have tumor in the brain, it's more important to treat them uh, versus uh, having some side effects from the medicine in the brain. I think many of the molecular target therapies we have are pretty uh, how would I say, it? Uh, mostly don't have neurological side effects. There are some that have um, some visual disturbances um, and some maybe some other neurological uh, challenges, but uh, the ones that are serious, you know, we would uh, not be, they would never get approved. Um, so I think over long-term, I don't see any negative consequences of most of the drugs that we are, have developed that can go into the brain. Uh, but I think we need to continue to do better on the research uh, that we can get more targeted and higher concentrations in the brain. Thank you. Um, another question has come up is about the sequence of the development of gefitinib versus getting it approved for EGFR. Mm -hmm. For most of the targeted therapies, we find the target, we go through clinical trials and the drug gets approved. Gefitinib got approved before we actually were sure that it targeted EGFR. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, Jafitna was developed at a time when we thought that just EGF receptor was an important target in lung cancer, but we didn't even know that mutations existed. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's just the way sometimes science works, unfortunately. Uh, if we know about the target, then it's much easier to try to develop a therapy for it. Uh, and so, for example, after ALK fusions were found in lung cancer in uh, the late 2000s, then there was efforts to develop the ALK fusions, uh, the ALK inhibitors. Um, but un unfortunately, I would say in drug development, it's only after the fact sometimes that we find out that there's a particular subset uh, that benefits the most. So I think what I'm saying is you have to do both. You have to do target-driven discovery. So if we have great targets, uh, like say KRAS, T12C, uh, and then we really try to figure out how to drug that, that's one way forward. But you could argue that the immunotherapies, for example, were developed in the absence of a real target, and then only afterwards PDL1 was found to be a better predictor. So drug development, unfortunately, just works in both ways. Okay. Um, another question that comes in, you mentioned uh, the drug imatinib, Glevic, for chronic myelogenous leukemia. And right now, statistics are showing that for CML, some of those patients are now achieving almost normal lifespans. Is that possible for lung cancer, do you think? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question. It's very hard to compare cancer to cancer. Uh, you know, there's more than 200 types of cancer. And then even at the molecular level, there's way more uh, different tumor types. Um, one of the things about um, CML, especially if you catch it early, is there's very little molecular, what's called molecular heterogeneity. Uh, so for example, uh, it looks like if it catches very, very early, most of the cells have the same mutation, for example, and then they don't have a lot of resistance mutations. Um, the more cells you have in the body that's cancerous, then the more mutations you can have. And so the more advanced, uh, the, the, the more resistance can develop. So I would say, um, I think it's possible. Right now, lung cancer seems to be a lot more heterogeneous and have a lot more mutations. But that said, I still know that there's patients with EGF receptor mutations that have lived 10 plus years. Uh, and so it is possible and also other uh, alterations. So it's possible, but I don't think we fully understand exactly uh, who those are right now. But immunotherapy also is leading to that tail, that we, the, 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 what we call the tail on the Captain Meyer curve, where we're also seeing 10 to 20% of patients live uh, for years that we haven't seen before. That's really encouraging. Um, <laughs> so mostly on targeted therapies, we've been focusing on a single driver, but now we're finding that there are some other drivers, passenger mutations possibly, that, that might have some impact on survival. And one of the questions that's come up is about small cell transformation. Um, is this occurring as a resistance mechanism 
and what kind of research is going on to treat that? Yeah, so um, the person is asking about small cell lung cancer transformation. So <clears throat> what's happened is patients who originally have non-small cell lung cancer, usually adenocarcinoma, over a long period of time on treatment, uh, start to have progression. And then when you re-biopsy, it turns out they have small cell instead of non-small cell. Um, what this really means is under the pressure of the drug, you know, in an evolutionary system, the cells have become more de-differentiated. Uh, this is like a response to an external pressure. Um, and uh, it, it is a consequence. We, you know, even back in 2005, I think, in 2005, we and others showed that, you know, it happened with gefitinib uh, and erlotinib. And then now people have shown it with other targeted therapies. There is still a lot of research going on on how can an adenocarcinoma transform into a small cell. If you really want to get into the science, uh, some of it has to do with loss of some tumor suppressor genes, such as P53 and RB. Um, but I would say there's not a great um, insight as to how to treat those yet. Uh, right now, I think uh, people are using chemotherapy for small cell, um, but there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to particularly target small cell transformation uh, after a long term on targeted therapy. Incidentally, it doesn't just happen in lung cancer, it also happens in prostate cancer and some other cancers. Oh. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, so uh, about uh, after androgen uh, therapy in prostate cancer, you can also get small cell uh, transformation. Okay, uh, another question. Are there any fourth generation TKIs in the works that you know of that are being researched or in clinical trials? Uh, fourth for EGFR, I, I am assuming, or just in general? The, the question was general. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of companies and even bio, small biotechs that are going after next generation TKIs in multiple subsets. Uh, for example, even in EGFR, there are um, companies going after a very specific mutation called C797S, which happens after uh, resistance to uh, osimertinib. Uh, and then, for example, an outfusion positive lung cancer, NTRAC. Multiple examples. I, I think what's incredible now is using modern scientific techniques, you can also try to predict, you know, what is the spectrum of mutations that will occur at the very same time that you're developing the drug so that you could then be prepared, hopefully, with the next generation uh, in time for a patient. But if, you know, if it's not in time, then it would be for the subs uh, for subsequent patients. Okay. Um a uh, question from Jill. There's a distinct difference in approach to treatment depending on biomarkers. Shouldn't there be reflex biomarker testing upon diagnosis like there um, is for non-small cell lung cancer, but across all lung non-small cell lung cancer types? Uh, if I understand the question, should it be applied to squamous cell and large cell carcinoma? Is that the... Uh... Yes, and, and even maybe neuroendocrine? Well, I'll, pro I'll probably say something that wouldn't follow guidelines, so I don't want to violate any guidelines. But, but essentially, I mean, I think molecular, to me, <laughs> to me, molecular uh, diagnosis would trump a histological diagnosis. So, that, you know, every once in a while, you we will find an AGF receptor mutation in a squamous cell carcinoma or neuroendocrine. Uh, so I would be supportive of that. But, you know, I know that there's guidelines uh, that uh, specifically say like adenocarcinoma has reflex testing. Okay, another question has come in uh, regarding tumor markers as opposed to doing biomarker testing looking for genomic variations. There are some tumor marker used in other cancers like CEA or other things to indicate whether a patient is progressing. Um, are those useful in lung cancer? Can we use those to figure out what the next treatment should be? Mm, yeah, that's a really great question. So right now, there's no great biomarker, biomarker like that in lung cancer. You know, you have CA199 in ovarian cancer, you have CA in some colon cancers, not all colon cancers, um, and then some other markers. I think the most promising data look like the, it'll be the like, circulating tumor DNA. Uh, so there are lots of studies now looking at CT DNA. Uh, to see if those can be better predictors of whether the cancer is under control or not. Uh, you know, I think a lot more research still needs to be done 
um, but it might not be a protein marker like uh, CEA or the CA99, but more like the CTDNA. Okay. So another question from Anne-Marie. We've kind of had a wrench thrown in cancer development this year by COVID-19. Can you talk about how that is affecting research trials and um, drug development? Uh, yeah, I mean, COVID-19 obviously has been affecting us all uh, pretty much around the world. Um, what we have seen is that, uh, unfortunately, because of the hospitals being uh, inundated by patients with COVID and also the requirements for the intensive care units and other um, like phase one units and things to be taking care of COVID patients that we have seen an impact. Uh, for example, clinical trial enrollment has slowed down. I think it really depends on country. Uh, you know, the U.S. has been particularly impacted. Some of the European ones over the summer were doing better, some of the Asian ones as well. But I think in general, we're seeing a slowing down uh, of clinical trial enrollment uh, and accrual. The other thing that we're seeing is, unfortunately, that patients are uh, not going to the doctor as much. So they're also skipping screening uh, tests uh, and other things, which then means that maybe some patients will be diagnosed with their cancers at a later stage. Uh, rather than an early stage. So, you know, I think we really have to, um, you know, cancer is not waiting for COVID. Uh, so we need to really, you know, get the epidemic or pandemic under control and then also make sure the hospitals and the doctor's offices are safe enough uh, for patients to go in and get the treatment that they need. Okay, thank you. There've been some questions that come in about liquid biopsy. Um, the question is, uh, since tissue is the gold standard, but we know liquid biopsy comes back faster and requires less tissue, um, do you think that we could at some point rely on liquid biopsy or, or do liquid biopsy first and then follow up with tissue to confirm? How would you handle well, yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we'll make some progress. For example, um, with the, the BFAST study that I talked to you about, uh, that's where in particular we did liquid biopsies to find outfusions. And then if we found an outfusion in the liquid biopsy, then we treated patients with electinib. And then we saw the same response rates uh, that you would see if you had a tumor biopsy. So we have filed that with the FDA. And you know, if approved, then it would be the, one of the first times um, I think that we, the community is saying, regulatory agencies are saying, yeah, you only need a liquid biopsy and not a tumor biopsy. So I think we will make progress. That was the point I was trying to make there. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, staying, on, staying on the topic of biomarkers, we have a couple of biomarkers for immunotherapy, PDL1 and tumor mutation burden that looks at the amount of mutations in the cell. Yeah. But in general, they don't seem to be quite as reliable at predicting um, how well a patient will respond. We have yeah. patients who have high PDL1 who don't respond and low PDL1 who do respond. Yeah. Um, are we looking for better biomarkers for immunotherapy? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, we're getting a little bit spoiled, I think, from having 70, 80% response rates with these uh, genetic driver mutations. Uh, so I think that's the ideal. You know, if you had an EGF receptor mutation, you have a 70, 80% chance of uh, benefiting. Um, and then if you don't, then you're unlikely to benefit. But you're right. I mean, right now we don't have great tests for uh, immunotherapy, and there's a lot of activity going on to try to identify uh, better ones. I think one conclusion right now is it's just going to be more complicated uh, than we uh, anticipated. Um, but I think the ultimate goal is to try to get up to the 70, 80 percent predictability rates. Okay. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about drug combinations. Mm -hmm. um, drug combinations seem to be one of our best hopes for overcoming this acquired resistance. If you try to put all the different drugs together, there are thousands of combinations. Um, how do we determine whether or not a particular combination is our best bet before going to a clinical trial? You're talking for an individual patient. Yeah, I mean, I think or, that's where- Or even in general, I mean, for the population. Yeah, I, uh, I think some of it is rational and then some of it is empiric. Uh, so rational meaning the more we understand about the biology of the tumor and what, how the tumor can so-called escape, you know, then we can do more rational combinations. An example of that is in EGFR mutant lung cancer, 
you know, about 20% of the time you get amplification of uh, another gene called MET. Uh, and then you, you, you no longer need, uh, you, you sort of bypass signaling from EGFR. So if you know that ahead of time, then you can say, hey, you know, I need to have an EGFR and a MET combination. And indeed people have shown that that combination can overcome resistance. Um, but I would say there's other ones, like especially with cancer immunotherapy where uh, like combination with um, a, a different kind of TKI has been shown to be super beneficial, not in lung cancer, but like in renal cell carcinoma, uh, where I think it would have been hard to predict uh, which combination would have been uh, the most effective. So I think we need more rational, biologically driven combinations. And then we also need to st unfortunately still do some empiric testing uh, to figure out what uh, maybe some unexpected combinations that we didn't think about. I think what you're asking though, is how do you sift through a thousand combinations versus uh, having the most uh, rational ones? I think there, you know, it really depends on the science and how much rational, um, understanding there is of the tumor and what you're trying to treat. Okay. Um, we mentioned a little bit about co-mutations. And there's also been some recent research that finds that for several different genomic drivers, we seem to be having resistance popping up in the same pathways. Um, what kind of research is going on with relationship to these co-mutations or acquired new mutations? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, again, there's a lot of active research going on. It, it all requires tissue biopsies or, or tumor biopsies, and then really understanding uh, what can occur. I think the most important thing is, you know, how do you also have a database where you can keep track of and collect all of these kinds of uh, data? Uh, because if you start to do one-offs and one patient has this, and one patient has that, and then no one's sort of putting that all together, even if you found that co-mutation, you might not know how to treat it. Uh, and so I think, you know, we also could do, and, and, and you know, I think the advocate community could also do a great job on how do we figure out, how do we pool all this information so that if a new patient has such and such mutation, you could just say, hey, in the database, has anyone had this co-mutation before and what did they get and did it benefit them or not? You know, I think that would also uh, improve our ability to do precision medicine. Well, you led me right into my next question here. <laughs> um, so several of the patient groups that are focused on specific biomarkers, like the EGFR resistors, ALK positive, the Ross Wonders, are considering ways to collect their real world data so that they can help accelerate research. Mm -hmm. In your view, what sort of questions in real world data would be most useful for us to gather? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, there is this privacy data privacy issue. So uh, I'm assuming that if you collect that data, somehow the data privacy issue is, uh, is addressed. Uh, well, we would be doing it using an IRB approved um, yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, what people are really interested in, you know, researchers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, etc., is obviously how does a patient do? So then the data have to just be very, very clean, so to speak. So, you know, um, we need to know how long patients were on therapy. So the starting date, uh, you know, when did they stop that therapy? Um, what actually happened on that therapy? Did the tumor grow? Did it shrink? Uh, did it stay the same? Um, uh, and all these kinds of variables in addition to, you know, gender, uh, age, smoking history, uh, et cetera. I would say it's just, it's not, it's not a hundred percent easy because, you know, um, there's a company called Flatiron Health, which is actually owned by Roche, but it, they actually pay an army of nurse practitioners to clean the data. Uh, cleaning the data means putting it in a structured format uh, so that it's all the same and searchable. Uh, so I would encourage maybe the advocates to come up, uh, and I'm happy to put you in touch with the Flatiron folks too, um, you know, where you can somehow say these are the key pieces of data and then when we put it in it will always be in the same structured format so that when you actually go to do a search it's easy to find you know medicine is complicated because there's multiple terms for the same thing um, but if people are using five different terms for the same thing in five different databases then it makes it very hard for them uh, to be comparable or, or, or useful Okay, um, we have just a little time left, so I'm going to um, spring a question on you that uh, you may not have thought about. Um, what are, besides providing real world data, what are some other ways in which patients can help researchers accelerate research? 
How can we partner oh, yeah. with you? Well, that is a great question. I mean, patient centricity is key to uh, drug development. Uh, so first is really understanding what the, what the needs of uh, patients are uh, and really, you know, teaching the scientists uh, not only what's going on in the tumor, for example, but also what's, what's clinically important and how can a medicine actually be beneficial. Um, so that's really important to convey to, uh, to, the, uh, to the scientists and everyone working on drug development. Um, and it even comes down to side effects and other things, right? Uh, what, 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 what's tolerable, what's not, um, what, what is ultimately going to be a benefit? That's one. I think the second one, as I highlighted before in the talk, was just um, somehow allowing for access to tissue. Uh, hopefully with liquid biopsies, it'll be easier. Um, but, you know, sometimes we still will probably require tumor biopsies. Uh, and it's just invaluable in terms of giving insights as to what's happening uh, on those treatments. Still, you know, now when new therapies get approved uh, and then patients get them, still sometimes I hear that, uh, you know, patients don't want to go under biopsy after their tumors progress uh, because there's not necessarily another option that's offered to them. Um, but then if you don't get that tumor biopsy, then we can't understand what's happening and then try to develop the next medicine. But I do understand it's a big burden to have to go through those biopsies, so not everybody can do that. Um, but they are really helpful uh, when patients can do that. So are those there, are a couple. Yeah. I was going to say, are there other opportunities for patient research advocates who are, who are becoming knowledgeable about research and the science to work with industry to be able to help um, make protocols more patient friendly or um, give you ideas of the questions that are important to patients. If someone were interested in that, how might they go about it? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, you know, uh, in the NIH and with granting agencies, I think patient advocates are also playing a huge role uh, in terms of trying to help guide scientists into what's um, what makes sense from a patient perspective in terms of the trials that are being proposed. Uh, but I would also agree with you that even in pharmaceutical companies, it's important for us to consider, you know, what you said, patient-friendly trials, right? I mean, there's some times when you need a trial where you need more tissue or more blood sampling and things, but there are other times when patient centricity and really, you know, making it as easy for the patient as possible is really critical. So I would encourage all of you to, you know, I think most pharmaceutical companies also take into account patient advocacy groups. Uh, and appreciate the feedback uh, that's given on various trials. Uh, you know, I think one of the things I would tell you is that a lot of times uh, the people that are writing those trials, they haven't actually had to sit in the clinic and walk through all the things that we ask them to do. So even explaining that I think is really important. Uh, and another point I would say is, you know, when I was a fellow, uh, consent protocols were like, for the patients were like three pages. Uh, and my understanding is they're now like 20 pages or something like that. So, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it goes both ways. There are probably regulatory agencies and IRBs and things that are also requiring more. But, you know, but if we could simplify the whole process, I think it would make it easier for everybody. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you, William, for your time and for your clear answers. There are many questions that we didn't get to and the STARS program will make an effort to collect those questions and post them on the website. Um, thank you for joining me today and to our audience, please keep an eye out for an email that will be sent with program evaluation later today. And thank you and that's the end of this webinar. Thanks so much. Take care everybody.